Hello and welcome to the Minor Tweak Major Impact podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Protocols.io, an open access repository for science methods, computational workflows, clinical trials, and any instructions and manuals. If you would like to share your method development story with us on this show, I would love to hear from you. You can reach me at anita at protocols.io. That is A-N-I-T-A at protocols.io. I'm excited to have Anna Behle as the guest for today's episode. Anna studied biology at the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf in Germany. There she completed her master's thesis at the Institute for Synthetic Microbiology led by Ilka Exman, which she also joined for her PhD two years ago. Anna's work focuses on gene regulation in cyanobacteria, with a special focus on the regulation of DNA topology, which is known to be a global regulatory mechanism in the cell to sense environmental conditions such as nutrient availability and respond to adjusting gene expression of genes in different ways. Her group is working to gain an understanding in order to precisely manipulate the metabolic state of the cells. Anna, I would like to welcome you to the Minor Tweak Major Impact podcast. Thanks for having me. Anna, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what you're currently working on? I'm a second year PhD student at Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf, and I work at the Institute for Synthetic Microbiology. My main project in my PhD focuses on DNA topology or more specifically DNA supercoiling in cyanobacteria. And we're mainly interested in supercoiling mediated changes in global gene expression, but ultimately we're hoping to manipulate this global system to our advantage. So create sort of a more synthetic biology system from it. And since this project requires a lot of precise fine tuning on a regulatory or genetic level, I also started another subproject within this project, which is focusing more on characterizing synthetic regulatory tools in cyanobacteria. Currently, the stuff I'm focusing mostly on are chemically inducible promoters because there are not that many available in cyanobacteria yet. And building from my master's thesis, I was actually able to implement a pretty decently working reporter system for this. So that's my current project. On Protocols.io, there are about 4,000 public protocols now. And out of all the public protocols, one that you published, a recipe for a 50x TAE buffer, is by far the most viewed and exported one. Can you please tell us what a 50x TAE buffer is and what it's typically used for in the lab? 50XTAE buffer is a stock solution for just a standard agarose gel electrophoresis. It's made from tris space, EDTA, and acetic acid. And usually a standard molecular biology lab, such as ours, for example, uses a lot of this stuff. So everybody needs it pretty much daily. And almost every lab goes through a lot of it. So actually, every almost every lab that I know makes its own. Can that also be bought from a vendor or is it usually made from scratch? So you can buy it. We don't buy it because we just go through so much that I guess it would be very expensive to buy it. There are other buffers for gel electrophoresis, for example, TBE buffer, which has, I think, boric acid instead of acetic acid. And we use this for RNA work. And in this case, we do buy it because we just want to make sure that it is completely RNA free because RNA work in general could be quite tricky and just want to make sure that it's up to like analytical standards. But TAE buffer in general, I mean, like I said, you can buy it, but most labs that I know really do make their own. Did you ever experience a minor tweak, major impact moment in your work? I did experience one during my master's thesis a while back, though. So I was working on small regulatory RNAs in cyanobacteria, which are small non-coding RNA molecules, and they are able to bind to a target mRNA, or one or multiple, actually. And usually they either activate or repress gene expression. And since some of these molecules are too small to quantify via like a normal quantification method such as qPCR, so I think for qPCR the fragment size has to be at least 100 base pairs and these small RNAs are usually a little or even a lot smaller than that. We kind of had to use a different method, which is northern blot analysis, which is kind of an old school method, I would almost say. And basically this works in a way where you separate your RNA in a polyacrylamide gel Then you blot this into a membrane and then you add a labeled nucleotide probe, which has base complementarity to the fragment that you're interested in. So in this case, the small RNA. And the whole protocol is pretty lengthy in time and also 
it has a lot of components to it. So you have to hybridize it overnight and then you have to wash the membrane and then you have to incubate with an antibody and then wash it again. And then you have to detect the antibody basically by, by luminescence. And the problem was, I'm actually not quite sure what the problem was. First of all, the, during my master's, this was the first time that I actually did northern blot analysis, and it was never a very popular method in our lab because nobody really got that amazing results from it. And I just tried it again and again and again, and I, like I went through so many of these membranes, and I never was able to visualize my small RNA. So once I did it with my supervisor for the first time, and we were actually able to get weak signals, so the method seemed to work. But ever since then, whenever I did it on my own, it, it just never worked again. And the closer I got to my deadline, like, you know, handing in my master's thesis, the more anxious I was to, to get this to work. And so then finally, I decided to try a different approach. And so this antibody labeling method was actually developed to kind of get away from the classical method, which is radioactive labeling of RNA probes. And so I decided to try to go with the old way of labeling with radioactive nucleotides and like almost immediately I got like really beautiful northern blot images and also the amount of time that it took to do one of these northern blot analyses was like half than before. How long does it usually take to do one of these northern plots? You start by performing your gel electrophoresis that takes maybe half a day from front to back and then you have your membrane and then You hybridize it usually overnight, and then the next day you take like half of the day to wash and add the antibody and wash again and so on. And this whole second half of the day, I, d I was just able to completely cut. So basically, I just hybridize with a, with a radioactive nucleotides overnight, and then I just take the membrane, wash it, and then immediately I'm able to get my results almost. So how long did you in total try to make this other method work again before you started using the method that worked faster even? I'm not quite sure. A couple of months maybe. But I mean, the master's thesis is usually only a little over half a year. So a couple of months are, is actually, you know, quite a lot of time, especially if you don't even know if it worked in the first place. If, like if you need the data to build upon that. But then in the end, everything worked out. So that's good. It did. What are some challenging parts of method development or method optimization you have experienced with your work? And that might also be related to if new students or new people come into the lab, what are some challenging parts to make sure that they understand the methods and protocols that are used in the lab in the correct way and do them as everybody else does them? Because usually people do things a little bit differently, so it might happen that somebody understands something in a different way. So what are things, some things you do to make sure everybody uses things the same way or what are some challenging parts you see of that? I think in general, it's true that everybody kind of has their own little rep, maybe repertoire of protocols. And this can be really great because you have like a lot of expertise in a lab if everybody does their own thing. But it can also be a huge challenge, especially for new members, because Usually everybody gets their own supervisor and depending on which supervisor you have, maybe you learn something completely differently and, but you don't really learn the background of how the person got there in the first place. So, I mean, this is kind of also like a, a method evolution maybe because like over the years, methods are, are adapted and developed and changed because somebody maybe discovered like a, a minor tweak or something. But then when you search the literature, because you're like, a newcomer and you just want to start from scratch, then the original method kind of looks totally different than the one that is maybe standard in the lab now. And I think actually in our lab, protocols I owed did help a lot. Actually, I think in 2016 or something, one of our colleagues initiated a mini hackathon where we just got together with our laptops and sat down and everybody just started typing in like all the standard protocols and all the specific protocols that we had into protocols at IO. And after this hackathon was done, we also actually started to use protocols on a daily basis almost. And I think this is cool because you can like meet halfway, sort of like the different people with different experience can work on protocols together and discuss advantages, disadvantages, maybe include minor notes that you normally just know in your head, but wouldn't necessarily put in like a Word document protocol or something. And then also after it's published, you can also further discuss stuff on the internet. People can add what's their experience. So I think actually trying to pull all of this knowledge from the different labs in a platform like protocols is really great for this kind of thing. 
And we also, we try to implement this also with our students and our um, classes and also our IGEM team, for example, to get people to, to have more of a central hub where they can look for protocols. What are some tools that you use on a daily basis that help you keep all your lab work organized and keep track of your work? I'm rather chaotic as a person and also like in, in, the, in a lab setting, I tend to do a lot of things at once because I get bored otherwise. So it's really important for me to be organized, at least in my research. And what I try to do is I write everything down in a, in a paper lab notebook, actually. I realized early on that this was necessary because I tend to forget things very quickly. I try to make a to-do list daily, like for the next day or for the next week. And whenever I don't get something done that I wanted to get done, I just, you know, keep adding it to the next to-do list until I get it done. I also do this for weekly and monthly. And sometimes like half, when half of the year has passed, I try to do this even for a yearly basis. It doesn't necessarily work out in terms of what I get done, but I always have in mind what I really need to get done in order to move forward with my research. I also try to keep sub-projects organized on the computer by having like a current progress report running like in a PowerPoint presentation or something. And I also try to add like interesting little side notes I find in the literature because sometimes like some like of the small details that people tend to not focus on in, in literature, but just refer to in a side note can be really important for my own research. So I try to keep up with that by keeping lists like that. And then my last question is, do you have any favorite lab tool? And if you do, why is that your favorite tool? I have to say the Snapgene software, because that is something that I literally use daily. And it has made my life so much easier in terms of cloning and keeping all my constructs organized, because I do an insane amount of molecular cloning. And I have so many constructs. And if it wasn't for Snapgene, I don't know how I would keep that organized. Cool. Anna, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your story and insights on the Minor Tweak Major Impact podcast. Thank you. This is your host, Anita, and we look forward to being with you for our next episode.